DV3 session. And uh, we're going to talk about codes, locks, and thank you for being here. And um, uh, I think uh, we'll have a little fun today. So that's my goal. Uh, so where to start uh, with access control design? I was on a project uh, a few years ago, and we were walking around and the end of the campus and several buildings. And, and one of the uh, one of the folks that was walking around with me said, "Wow!" He said, "Where do you start? Where do you start?" And I said, "Well, I start with life safety uh, because uh, if I get a building that isn't designed in the right way for life safety, then all of our tools and toys and gimmicks and stuff and response and security guards and dogs and shotguns and all the wonderful things we might be used." Uh, none of that works, right? If the building is designed wrong. So there, there are some mantras that, that have to go on to what you're trying to do. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And, and just bring up the open issues and how you can use, uh, take advantage of it when you can. And obviously, you all know this, uh, how many times do you get uh, brought into a job and they go, well, we're we're uh, starting construction Monday, and nobody's thought about security. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. It's a little late, right? Um, and, and so that's not the time. That's not the time. Um, so, I what you tell me, you can only have two out of three things, good, fast, and cheap. Good, fast, and cheap, or bad. I think any two. Yeah, any two. Well, I don't know. At that point, maybe you get one, right, if it's that late. So that's kind of the problem. Yeah. Okay, so code compliant life safety, and, and uh, forgive me, there's actually several different ways to grab codes and different ones are applied. So I think uh, that I just spend my energy trying to uh, understand the IPC more than the others, and then I deal with the others as exceptions when somebody wants to push something differently on like, you know, the A101. Um, it's really interesting the way the codes are put together, and you all know, you've seen them, you've read them, or pieces of them, right? None of us have read all the code, there's no such thing as that. Um, but uh, I'll show you an example later uh, how these, these things get sort of copied and photocopied and patched, you know, that sort of thing. So who knows about um, no special knowledge? Who knows, who knows about no special knowledge? Those two, everybody does, right? Um, anybody? Depends on how you do it. Yeah, well, it really does, right? Uh, but really, uh, interpretation um, is a lever handle and a panic bar. And so we, on the back of the room, we have two panic bars on each uh, One on each leaf, right? And uh, so there's, that's accepted hardware when you're in the US. And, and when you're dealing with the IBC, and it's uh, getting generally accepted hardware in many, many countries in the world. But as you move around the world, you see a lot of different situations. I know uh, you've all been there, right? Uh, lever handles, um, if you can put your hand on it and turn it, there you go. It used to be knobs. I remember I was in Italy, and I was trying to figure out how to get out of a room one day, and I looked at it, and the knob didn't turn. And I finally realized that there was a button about that wide on the top and what you had to do is put your hand on the knob and squeeze the button and that opened the door. And it was very awkward actually on my hand, I was used to it, but that was something that I ran into and did a lot of strange things. In the US, uh, it's a lever, a knob doesn't even count anymore, okay? Um, and in California, that lever has to return to within half an inch of the door or else they think you can catch things on it. So a California lever always returns toward the door at the, at the tail end, whereas in a lot of other states it doesn't. So it just depends on where you are. All right, single action. Um, so that just means really that you gotta put your hand on the door and push it and it opens, or turn the lever and push it at the same time, or pull it, by the way. It's okay to have an exit door that opens toward you if it's a small enough space, right? So single action, and so my slide says, so what does that say about a deadbolt? And how many offices do you go into where somebody has put cylindrical locks 
and the, the spec builder puts cylindrical locks on the door and everybody's worried about their security. So the tenants have gone in and taken the nice fancy doors in the hallway and added deadbolts to them to get their security. And is that code compliant? No. So a deadbolt, it's a second action, isn't it? So if you have to turn the deadbolt to unlock it and then put your hand on the lever, that's two actions, that's not code compliant. So a mortise lock with a deadbolt always is manufactured such that on that inside handle, you turn the lever, it brings back the deadbolt and the, and the thing. So if you, the latch thing. Good English, right? So, so it, the question that would be is, if the deadbolts say are individual offices, you know, persons, core companies, they, if they are instructed, and therefore they, they, they have these instructions, been imparted to them, can, can that still have this independent deadbolt? If they are what? So it, it's a, a person's work office, and there's a deadbolt on the door, and they've been told how to operate. No, it doesn't have to. It's got to, you know, that's a great question. So the, the question was, if they have a deadbolt and they've been instructed how to get out of their office, is it okay? And the answer is no, because the other, another person might be sharing their office or in there. And, and so instruction doesn't count just the way time doesn't count. And time is an interesting thing. A lot of people say, hey, you know, at night there's not that many people here, so I can hard lock or no, you can't. The code is uh, not respectful of time. It's a respectful of occupancy, the number of people. Of course. All code is respectful of the number of people, and it relates to how many people you have. But for a deadbolt, you can't put it on a door. It, it zeroes the answer. Yeah. But at other times, if you have low occupancy at night, can, it be, can you have a different operation than during the day? No. You want to, Dave wants to know if you can have a different operation. If you can design the building so that it operates differently at night because you don't have very many people there. And in general, the answer to that is no. All right, so in fact, uh, let me give you an example of why you can interpret the code specifically to that extent, okay? If you go back five years and you look at the IVC, and you look at the sign that used to be above the doors where you could deadbolt the, the exterior door, it used to say the required one inch high letters over the door, these doors are to remain unlocked during business hours. It no longer says that. It now says these doors are to remain unlocked when occupied, when the building's occupied. Okay, so the code found out that people were misinterpreting their intent to be able to say business hours and there they could lock that door, they realized that was a, a mistake on the code writer's part, so they changed it so that it says when occupied. There's a great example. Everything applies that way. Yeah. Okay? So everybody got that? And, and is that uh, if you still have the old ones? Is that grandfathered in, or we have to replace the? Yeah, well, I don't know that answer. If, if you, you're grandfathered in as long as you don't touch the door. The second you touch the door, you got to change the sign. Comply with today's code. So that means so Robert, you have Robert access asked, to control. Then now you have If you have access to control, so Robert asked. Okay, just for your tape. Um, uh, you know, does the old. Uh, sign comply and it does it's grandfathered but as soon as you touch the door and do anything at all i bet you could rekey it and get away with it but if you do really anything to the door and debbie says no then you gotta deal with it right? thank you you can rekey as long as you not touch the lock yeah there you go and one more question then i gotta move on right. occupancy type i2 say again i'm sorry occupancy type i2 the lock facility Oh yeah, well, there are a lot of interesting exceptions. I'm not going to go there, uh, but but uh, when you're, um, we've, we've got all sorts of interesting things we can do with the code. Uh, there are many types of occupancies in the code, and so you have to look at the occupancy, and in any one section, if it determines that there's a piece of the code that doesn't apply or does apply, it, it definitely is very definitive about the occupancy issue. All right, um, we're going to talk more about access control and egress doors, but let me just say up until a few years ago, the words access control showed up as that pair of words one place in the code, and it's in there. 
and nowhere else. Now it, it shows up in a couple other places. I've looked through, at least I haven't found any others, okay? Um, and so the fact that it shows up in that one spot is really harmful to all of us from the standpoint of how the people that don't read the code very well interpret it. So I've actually flown all the way to the East Coast twice in my career just to sit down with a certain fire marshal here or a fire marshal there. And I've won both those arguments once I got them through the whole thing. So we'll talk about that. Um, two ways out. OK, so depends on the size of the space, right? So then if you're asking about how many people. How many people is a occupancy type and a square foot per person? OK, that's how they calculate. And it varies depending on the type of occupancy. Most of what we work in is business stuff, at least what most of I do. But there's manufacturing sites. There's all sorts of occupancies, you know, hospitals and uh, places of incarceration and everything else. You should note that it's either gross or net square footage that you have to do. Yeah, it's gross. It's, it's it really depends on the occupancy. Depends when you go to the table. Ah, okay. You have to look at the table more closely than either net or gross. That's my code guy here too. So gross <laughs> or net. So that's a good idea. But it, but it includes hallways. It includes stuff like that. Yes. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Good. Um, elevator lobbies. Um, the elevator lobby on this floor, I think. Some of it. Some. I'm not sure if they're all the same. But you'll notice there's um, a wall, and then there's uh, some elevators and, and an opening, OK? So an elevator lobby, by definition, can have doors on either end, or it can be on one end. And, and so that kind of gets into what we have to do with doors sometimes. So we'll talk about that as we go. Um, stairs, sometimes. OK. So it turns out that. Um, if you're on the ground floor and you can go out the doors, then you know you're not worried about stairs. Um, there will classically be two stairs in a building or more, and the door that's on that ground floor will be the, the discharge door and, and what they call the discharge door. So if you're if it's a multi-story building coming up or down, and you come up to that level, that door going out. Uh, one of them has to basically go virtually directly out of the building. It can go in a rated corridor out of the building. The other door can go directly out of the building, or it can go into the lobby and then go out of the building, right? But you can't have both of those discharge doors going into the lobby, just one. Okay. So that's, and then when you get off the ground floor, then there's changes that we'll be talking about. And so if you want to, lock the door from the stairway side. It's an interesting uh, issue that we're going to talk about, about how you do it and what you do with that. Um, and then, of course, certain rooms. You know, if you have enough amps going through a room, you need two ways out of that room, and they have to be bandit guard room. And there's things like that. So there's all sorts of special cases. All right, this is access control the egress door. This is that one section of the code. Now, how secure do you think this is by the time we do all this? So you need a sensor on the egress side of the door, and yet you're locking the way out. Why are you doing that? So historically, before another section of the code was added, this was what applied to any door that had a magnetic lock on it, because you had no mechanical egressing to a magnet. Right? There's no lever on the magnet that you turn to open the door. You can't do that. And so now there is some new code, which we'll see in a minute that allows you to do magnetic locks differently. But if you're, if you're controlling exiting out of the door, that's what this is about. So loss of power to that part of the access control system that controls the lock must unlock. Now, what that means is if you are locking the path out, and if there's a loss of power to um, the at that at that door, then the access control system, if it loses power, it has to fail to the safe state. 
Okay, I'm not talking about coming in yet. I'm talking still about egressing. Okay, so as you're going out, now how many people do that and how many people realize that? Okay, so that, there are a lot of people that realize that, but there are a lot of people that don't, including manufacturers of access control systems who don't even give you a good way to deal with that very well. So the idea is if that section of the access control system loses power, it's got to fail safe. And so if they give you a form C relay, which has a common normally open, normally closed switch, and if you're not using the common, in this case, and normally open, and therefore running the relay in an energized state so that it's closed, giving your fail-safe lock the ability to unlock when it loses power, you're doing it wrong, in my opinion. Okay, that's the way I read that. So the, the, the issue that I always had with this is it, is it doesn't clarify, I'm going fast, it doesn't clarify whether it's primary or secondary power. So if if I'm plus primary but I have battery backup, I, I believe I can still maintain the lock on the door. Yeah, well. I, and um, that's a, that's a tough one and that's a hard one to, to talk about and depends on how it's applied and it depends on the inspector, right? Uh, so it's got to be a safe state, that's, that's true. And you're pushing a little bit on the edge of um, acceptability, but, but you know, Dave and I, we've always pushed a little bit on acceptability. <laughs> Uh, push to exit within five feet of the door, right? It has to last at least 30 seconds. It can actually last, right? And, and so it's okay if it's longer than 30 seconds, it can't be less. Fire alarm in the building, sprinkler in the building must unlock entrance doors, may not be locked uh, when open to the gen when the building's open to the general public. So what we're talking about is at the ground floor, the entrance door to the building, not the, or and it's actually suites to actually an entrance door to the building or an entrance door to the suite. Uh, now, in my opinion, by the time you've done all that, you've got kind of a mess. What if you have a hurricane, you're out of power for four days, and you don't have a generator, and you don't have batteries, your doors, if, if you're doing all that, then the way in is, is probably, because we don't have a lot of locks that lock the way out differently than the lock that the way in. I found one in England, it's a really great lock, it's got two solenoids, it's a, it's a fail safe on the inside handle and fail secure on the outside handle. I wish we had more of those down in building one. Okay, so just so that we know what we're talking about, I'm just, uh, you know, ways you can lock the door. And what's interesting to me is the lack of knowledge about how we could actually take a, um, a panic bar and electrically control it. So, um, if we have a, if we have that panic bar, it's a rim. It doesn't have vertical rods shown. It's got a latch shown. This is a latch, and um, so if you electrically want to unlock that, then there are several ways that you can do that. Right? Uh, one of them is that you can put a power supply or, or just run your power into it and you can retract that latch. The old way used to be uh, where everybody did it with a big clunky thing, right? Big power supply. Uh, and now the new way with everybody is you have a, a motorized function that pulls the latch back. Um, that's one way. Another way is with electrified trim, so you attach this to the other side of the door and you control the trim. I'm a big fan of that. Um, and I'm a big fan of that because it uses less current than trying to retract the latch. I'm a big fan of that because I can make it fail safe or fail secure. I can do anything I need to with it. And, um, and when you get to a door that happens to be rated, then you've got yourself a different problem because if you are doing something that retracts the latch, uh, then you can mess it up, right? Your, your integrator can mess it up, anybody can mess it up. And by that, what I mean is you design it right, uh, supposedly, 
And if it's a fire rated door, it's supposed to be self-closed and self-latched, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it's not latched when it's retracted. And if somebody mis a pro programs the system and it gets stuck in the, in the latch retracted position, it's not rated. So then, if you use the local power supply with it, you got to tie that into the fire alarm so it relatches it. So the whole thing's a glute, and it's a mess, and, and I, I don't like that. So if I use this, then this always latches, okay? So on a rated door, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, rated doors, it's really important to remember that you have to latch. Of course, this is a magnetic lock that's a face on. Um, they have shear locks that, that pull the magnet up. That's the, this is the most tolerant lock of, of a warped, a racked door. Uh, a shear lock is the least tolerant lock. I didn't even put one up here. Um, I try to never design anything with a mag lock at all. Uh, the next, when I get rid of them, uh, I also don't like cylinder, cylindrical locks because that dead locking latch right there will uh, not be very secure. And if the, if the door can go uh, this way just a little bit, you know, if, if somebody takes a silencers off, anybody know what a silencer is? Who knows? Hey, we got silencers. Okay, good. It's a little little button, right? Good answer. Little button on the door, right? They, when the door closes, it bumps the rubber bump. And if you take those out, the door closes a little farther, and then you can drop this in, and uh, then you can pry the whole thing open. So the dead locking latch on that is there, where it's this dead locking latch is vertically positioned, right? So it would be really hard for any of us in this room to take a door and move it up or down on the edge. Really hard. So, so that mortise casing is so much more secure than a cylindrical lock. Um, and so that's, we try always to design with mortise locks if we can. Um, over here is an electric strike. And uh, there's a whole bunch of different ones. And they're okay in certain conditions. I also don't really like electric strikes. How many doors do you go up to that have electric strikes? You present the card, the door doesn't unlock until you push it the opposite direction of travel, and then it releases the cam inside, and then you get to pull it. So you're doing this, boo boo, you know? And it's, that's crazy. So, um, you know, I'm no fan of electric strikes. John? So, yeah, wouldn't it be appropriate for us to say, well, you don't want to, you don't want to design the center process, but isn't it more appropriate if you select the product based on the project? That might be a viable solution. Okay, so John is asking me, is it a viable solution sometimes to use cylindrical locks on certain projects where the level of security of the door is maybe convenience and, and a little bit of auto trail and not so much security? And the answer is probably right. It's probably true. And then I go into office buildings where the office suite has no definition of what it's ever going to be and how critical it is. And they put a cylindrical lock on it. And in my opinion, that's never appropriate. So it is very much a, a question of the situation, of course. Of course. Uh, I'm just saying this is nowhere near the security of that. OK, next slide. OK, a lock versus a latch, right? A lock relates to whether the handle turns and a latch is what holds the door latch, right? And so uh, unlocking without unlatching is on a future slide. So I just put it there because I wanted to tease you about, OK, let's talk about what that really implies. Fail secure versus fail safe. If this beautiful app phone is actually a lock, and it's in my hand and no wires are connected to it and it's unlocked on both sides, what, what's its function? Is it fail safe or fail safe? Unlock both sides. If it's unlocked on both sides in my hand with no wires connected to it, what is it? Fail safe. Fail safe. It's fail safe. Good. Perfect answer. Okay. So the idea is fail safe is that um, in the towering inferno, I remember, everybody remembers you know, all this stupid stuff and the pyrotechnics are going off just because the electricity went out or something, I don't know what. Um, and anyway, you know, we have that case where everything in the chain has to, has to fail to the right condition. So we talked earlier about the access control system 
and his power and his fail, right? And there's other pieces in that chain. Uh, and sometimes there's a, another relay, there's an access control door, do you buy a fail safe, fail secure? You know, you gotta put all the pieces in so that if the wire breaks, the power goes out or whatever, uh, it fails to the safe condition. So everything has to be more safe as it, if it fails, if it breaks. I had a case where I had a uh, early days, a long time ago, a Halon system, right, before FM 400 and all of those goodies, right? Uh, so we had Halon, we're doing the ozone layer and everything. And, uh, and in there, there was, uh, there was a fire alarm output. And it's a form C relay, so it has common normally open, normally closed. And that went, and I had to turn off the air vents because if you put the halon in the room, you don't want it to go away because you want it to subdue the fire. And so by the time we got all the way down to the final damper, which you could buy in a spring-loaded, normally closed, and normally open state, and that spring-loaded damper was actually pneumatically controlled. Pneumatically was controlled by an E to P, so the electric didn't matter. Okay, so I had basically, I had five different choices, and um, I had an electrician that was very proud of himself, and he could do anything. Uh, and uh, when he originally installed it, he messed up and didn't do it quite for our drawings, right? And so he realized that it had a problem when in the normal state, the dampers were all closed, where they're supposed to be held open. So he swapped one of the relays and everything was good. Well, if you have five things, right, that all have a choice, then that's two, it's four, eight, 16, 32, right? 32 different ways to connect it, of which 16 are like when you're good here and you're good there, right? And you're bad here, you're bad there. So 16 ways look right. How many of them are right? One out of 32, right? But 16 ways to make it look right. So when you're thinking about your locks and your, your panels and your wires and your power supplies, you gotta think through the entire chain and fail, you know, safe, okay? Don't, don't blow that, that's important. Uh, fire rated has to self-close and self-flash. So those doors have door closers, they self-close. They have latches, they self-flash, okay? You'll notice that um, it's kind of fun, actually. Um, those are fire rated doors right there, okay? And um, they were ordered correctly in this room. So if you look at these doors, there's no, hole right here. There's no hole, okay? And the reason there's no hole is because they're supposed to self-close and self-latch. But that door opens, why? Because see, somebody, somebody has dogged this door. So it, we're in a room that's dangerous. I'm just kidding, don't worry about it. We'll all get out. But we're in a room that's dangerous because, because that door is dogged open, right? All right. And I love the locksmith industry and the manufacturers. I could pick on them a little bit. But um, some cases, uh, you find where the, the, the uh, nomenclature, things like uh, a uh, no dogging, or you, know, uh, you can't dog a door, right? Manual dogging. Manual dogging. No manual dogging, right? Okay, well that doesn't show up if you designated the door as a fire rated door because it's not an option because you can't manually dog it, right? But in other cases, you gotta define it. And so it varies. Um, and so the, the nomenclature gets a little confused. But in any case, on a fire rated door, it's gotta self-close and self-latch, okay? That's important. Uh, fire egress door is not a fire rated door, but it might be. Okay, a fire egress door is those doors, and, and it's our way out. So if that wasn't a rated corridor, then those doors might be fire, they will be fire egress doors. That's how you get out of the room and there's exit signs over them. But they don't need to be fire rated unless you've got that wall with those doors and it's separating fire penetration from here to there and there to here. Right, that's what a rated assembly does. It separates fire. Stairway door. So now we're talking about the upper stairway, so let's talk about that in a minute. So we're on a floor, uh, and um, actually, uh, 
Let me just put it this way right now, and then because I'll get to it, I got a little piece there. So stairway door, we're talking about a door from a, an upper or lower floor, not the discharge floor, not the way out. And then the discharge door is the one that's at that location where when you go out, you're going out of the building. So just it's important to remember those two. Please, sir. Okay, so here's the door. What if what if you want to audit out? So somebody says, I gotta do card in, card out. So it's kind of an interesting thing, right? Uh, so in order to talk through that, uh, we need to talk about some functions. So passage would be that the A and the B side are both unlocked. Okay, it's just a latch set. Okay, that's a passage function. Office function, uh, the B side is inside the room, the A side is outside the room, right? If this door comes closed, the A side's here. So that we'll call that outside, right? So an office function gives you a mechanical hand finger related way to change whether the B side is locked or not locked. It, it, it could be a push button on the edge of the door, it could be a thumb turn, it could be a lot of different things, but, but that's what an office function is. And there are a bunch of different office functions, so it's not just one thing. Classroom is like, um, I remember classroom really, really well because I copied my first key in the third grade and it was up to a classroom lock, right? And I don't know why I did it, but it was the place I did it. And, um, and so a classroom lock, you need a key to change its state uh, by locking uh, the A side, this is outside, by locking that A side of the door with a key, you can change it to a lock state or an unlock state. So it's good for a classroom. It's done for most of our security applications. So most of our security applications use what's called a storeroom function concept. Although typically they don't really make electric locks out of storeroom function locks. They make them out of other things. Anyway, uh, but a storeroom, what you do is you put your outside, you take the key, you put the key in there, and when you turn it, the latch retracts, you can open the door. When you get the key back in your hand and no longer in the lock, it's locked. That's a storeroom function, okay, so that's good. A silent function is if you're trying to lock both handles, like the A and the B side, and you're, and you're locking both of those. And once again, that's a special occupancy, right? So you're locking the inside. Um, you had a question, yes? The classroom, you're locking the outside. What about now with the anti-attack with the push button inside, so I can lock the inside now? Okay, so Greg has a question about what I kind of call a Columbine lock, but you're talking about a classroom where you want to be able to set it. So it's typically in that function a separate cylinder in here that you can use to turn to, to lock, lock out that door. So if you're told to lock down in a classroom situation, Sandy or wherever, you know, and you want to lock the, the door so that the bad guys can't get in. That's what that's about. So there's an extra cylinder there. So that's a, its own special function, but it's there. Um, I don't remember. I think it was a Sherlock McGill, John, I don't remember, but it had two solenoids in it. It was in England, and, and so I could do a fail safe on the inside and a fail secure on the outside, two different solenoids. Um, so here, if this is a, um, if this is a inside, let's say it's an IDF room with some critical data access, right? And we want to put a card reader on the inside and we want to audit when the people are in and when they're out. And so in North America, in easy use, how do we do that? And how do we want to do that? And what are the ramifications of that? So as I see it, uh, and, and I'd be open to options and for anybody that can give me options, uh, I tend to go with a lock set that is a normal uh, storeroom style lock set with an inside handle that's unlocked. I tend to do that. Some of my clients want me to uh, use an asylum function and lock both handles. They want to lock both handles because they don't want false alarms from people going out for getting to badge out. Okay? And that's all fine, except as soon as we do this function in this room, what have we done? We've gone to locking the exit path, haven't we? So now we go back to an access controlled egress door because we're <coughs> locking egress out of the room. And it's one electrical signal that unlocks both sides. 
So number one, we're back to that. We gotta put all the foo-foo stuff on it to make it work and go and be tied to the fire alarm and everything. And now my IDF closet's unlocked during any fire alarm. I don't like that. So I'd much rather get a false alarm using a local noise training aid and embarrass people to go in out than I would, uh, you know, do something else. And, and I, I advise a camera because then you can. We always use cameras. Yeah, but, but we're, we're talking about access. But, but then you get with a decent training aid. Yeah, you can put. Okay, here's a dumb guy that did this reason. Right. Yeah. Dave wants cameras. We do cameras there. Yes, sir. And if the room has to be that secure, the client doesn't typically mind adding a mag lock to support the egress. And a time delay works fine in most ordinances, right? So I can force their hand at that and use your use your storeroom function and use the time delay mag lock for controlling the egress. Because yeah, they, it's the same. Those, you can have a second lock. Those rooms have to be secure most of the yeah. time. They have to be fire rated and latching, and they can't right. have strike on them. They can't have you know. So it, the, the clients are typically accepting of spending those extra dollars to make sure that functions properly. So that's another way to do it, and it's a, it's a good add. Um, that's a two locking door, right, that way. If, if I could get the ASAP and Ingersoll Rand, or not them anymore, but Allegiant, excuse me, uh, if I could get them to build me a two solenoid lock, that would be great. One fail safe, one fail secure. We got them all in one lock. We're good to go. So that's my that's my on my wish list. Okay, uh, I don't like putting extra locks on the door. I did a job up in Oregon. It's a really cool job, and and they had a lot of traffic. And and this is an interesting door that we did too. We did panic hardware, which is you know touchy in, in and of itself. Uh, and we fixed it so that it was. Uh, electrically dogged open uh, all the time, uh, and we dropped it on firewalls. So it was panic hardware. We we uh, lose power and it would lock, you know, latch. So we got our latching out of it. We got our fire rating out of it. Although we really didn't need fire rating because it was an exterior door, and exterior doors are not fire rated typically unless there's a hazard right outside the door. All right. But we also have mag locks on those doors, so to your point. And so we use mag locks all the time, and in a fire, the mag locks lost power, so they didn't work. And the pan card where it started working, and so we got it during the fire. We met the fire code criteria, and the guy got his, uh, his very sloppy locks to, to make that work. Chris, so what are you doing with institutional doors in healthcare where dual swings required? And Path of egress is in both directions. Oh, uh, I call those S doors. Uh, you know, so so Chris asking me about a like a healthcare corridor where you've got two doors, one exits one way, one exits the other way. And in my opinion, I mean, we it can get complicated to go through that. I don't think there's any good way to secure that. There's lots of play things we can do, but I call those play security. Medic locks with pneumatic key switch override approved by the AHJ. You can do that. Yes, you can put um, things like that and, and overrides and one action. But uh, realistically, you can get from here to there and there to here. Okay. So the fact that you can get from here to there and there to here, in my opinion, the way I use that, I call that play security. So uh, let's go on. So I got this in the mail. I don't know. Does anybody here own this? I, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but. Um, this just came in my email, and it's saying strike while the door is hot, and it just showed up three days ago, so I had to put it in here. Hopefully I'm not getting myself in trouble. Uh, but it says you can put it on a fire-rated door, and it says that you can buy it uh, fail-safe and uh, you know, field-adjustable, open-fail, secure-fail-safe. So now, if a door that's rated has to self-latch, how in the world do you use an electric strike to make it latch, and especially a fail-safe one? Because as soon as you drop power, it's not holding the door, there's no latching. So I don't even know how they can advertise this, but I'm just it just came in in the mail. So I don't know. Let's go to the next slide before I get myself sued. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, stairway doors unlock both sides. Okay, so the, the code says if you've got a stairway door, now remember, it's not the ground floor, it's not discharge door, it's the upper floor or lower floor, right? Um, and so, uh, by the way, this is the code if it's like four floors, and this is the code if it's more than four floors, and they copied one from the other, and to me, that's like a fallacy in the code. They wrote the same language twice instead of combining it and making it logical in the code. They put it in two different places, but it says the same thing. So, stuff like that, I think that's really sad. Um, but I don't write codes, so. Um, openable exception, it's an exception. Openable from the egress side, so you can always go out and get it, right? and capable of being unlocked simultaneously without unlatching by a single action upon a signal from the fire command center or a, a single lobby location. I've adapted the bottom words just slightly, but that's what it means, right? Okay, so it means every door that you've locked, every stairwell door that you've locked on the stairwell side, if you do one action, you have to have all of those unlocked, okay? Alright. Um, so you don't have to lock every door, right? So you can have floor three, four, and five that are open because nobody cares, and it's into a, a, a hallway that connects the stairways and it's a public thing. And those you can leave them unlocked in both ways, right? You can do that. Uh, but if you've got somebody that wants to lock that door, they're a full floor tenant, we'll be talking about that in a minute, and they want to lock that door from the stairway side, then every one of the ones in that building, whether it's in the garage or it's in the, in the floors above, every one of those, um, then it has to unlock by that single action. Now, there's also this thing called access control egress doors, and we get into this, if you're trying to do something with uh, an elevator lobby, because that's not a stairway door, and so in, and we'll show in the plans the elevator lobby and what you have to do with that, because that's an access controlled egress door. That's not a stairway door. It's, it's different. So now, usually that switch is tied to the fire alarm, and the fire alarm projects those outputs to you, and when you're designing something with an access control system, you now have two fire alarm outputs that do different things. Okay, not one. You gotta deal with two. You should deal with two because by having it a manual switch, somebody can't walk in with a friend. I could get Dave to do this for me. I'd make him do the easy thing. He could just pull the fire alarm on floor three and I could go up to floor six and as soon as he pulls the fire alarm, I can get in, right? do that. So we don't want the stairway doors to do that. We don't. We want to keep them as secure as possible. Um, so in, in, in San Francisco when we had the, the shooting in 101 um, California, 101 California, and uh, the shooter, they couldn't, they couldn't tie the shooter down because he kept pulling the fire alarm. He'd get in the stairway, go to another floor, and shoot some more people, and then he'd get in the stairway again, go somewhere else, they couldn't find him up. And if they had done this this way, if they locked the doors to the stairway this way, then once they had him in the stairway, he would have been down and out, and they could have gotten a lot sooner, yes. You can ask me to keep, uh, uh, okay. uh, I think it's important to understand why those stairwell doors have to be unlocked during the fire. You remember that MGM grand fire in Las Vegas? Right. People right. went out into the stairwell to go down while the fire was in the, in the kitchen. The smoke filled the stairwell up. They couldn't get back into the floor. Of the floor. That's right. So what John, let me expound on that. So John's talking about, thank you for bringing that up. So the MGM grand fire, there were lots of grand fire. There were, there were lots of cases like that where you get into a stairwell and it's locked like, um, in the World Trade Center, or you know, stairwells were blocked. They had to get out of one stairwell, go to another, and get down. Um, so the whole concept of keeping that open for the life safety of the inhabitants of the building is a big deal. And secondly, the fire department doesn't want to have to 
do anything special to get from the stairway as we're coming out, out onto the floor. So it works for everybody. It works for us, it works for everybody, but we gotta take advantage of it. And as we design, we gotta know that we want two different fire alarm outputs, and we want them to work differently, and they're both fail safe. Fair enough? Okay. Yeah, just to add, um, you know, smoke control now is primarily just shaft pressurization. So on the closing of the door, we have to be able to get the door open when the stairwell is pressurizing, but also make sure that it's going to latch. Yeah. Closing. So that becomes a balancing actor in your acceptance test. It is. Yeah, with the pressure. But then we all know that we have actually pressure on balancing, balancing act on front doors and everything else too. So that's another challenge that we have as an industry. Um, elevator lobby doors. You know, when you're in that elevator lobby and there's a fire. The elevators return to the ground floor. Now you're there. Are you locked in? Uh, you shouldn't be. Uh, there should be a way to get from there directly to the stairwells. So we'll talk a little more about that. And then this got added uh, in nine dot nine uh, got added. I don't know five years ago. I think about something like that. And and that was kind of cool because it actually made maglocks halfway viable. Uh, in that case, right? So you can tie a switch, uh, uh, basically a UL listed switch, in your pan hardware and set it so that when you press it, it undoes the mag lock and then you can get out. And, and so uh, it's a, there's no fire alarm requirement in that section of the code. So a fire alarm doesn't have to unlock that door and, and you can tie it in. So that was a change. Um, I still don't like mag locks. Next. But, but Ed, uh, on the elevator lobby doors, it does make a difference because if they're and if you don't have direct access through an egress stair, then they read that same one that doesn't require a fire alarm and put. No, there's no part of the. It, it, um, I don't think you can do that there. Um, and they're in California now. We've got a, a new piece of the code that isn't in other states that allows the elevator lobby to be dealt with uh, on a local fire alarm and not anything in the building. And so it's got a bunch of requirements, but, but it's more localized. So they've done that too. Right. But in any case, the next slide will kind of get into that. Let's see. OK, so we're going to talk about these subjects. We're going to talk about elevator lobbies and Secondary path, I'll do that in a minute. Uh, stairwell doors, remember the exception, security, fire access. I'm going to talk about Z quarters, and I'm going to talk about freight elevators. So, uh, next slide. All right. So, we wanted to talk about um, uh, a bunch of different things. So, here's the elevator lobby. So, let's say that you're, um, you're in here. All right. Now, remember, you, it could be that this is a wall. One, one side could be a wall, right? You, only, you don't need two ways out of there. But you could be doors on both sides. It's a very, very common sort of architectural floor plan for a building, and that's the core. And so in here, if you're here, you can go out, and you can go to there, and you can go to there, but only if we've given you a means to override this thing. So if there's a fire alarm, they'll be unlocked, OK? Maybe one side of the analog, we could, we could argue that. Um, but it gives you it gives you a way out of there. All right. Yes. OK, I don't know if you're going to go there. What if both stairs are on the same side, right? And so you have the path down, right? Both stairs right, are on, on the same well, side. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to adapt this for a minute. And then we go this way, right? So that's one of the scenarios, right? If this is a wall down here. Okay, um, and if you were to do what you said, and we made this stair here, and there's the door, this doesn't exist, right? So what if both stairs are on? Then, so you have the you have your primary path that was obviously is south, left, and right. That does that's not two paths. You still have to have the other another way around to get to those stairwells. Right? You don't require a secondary path from an elevator lobby. This is just a room, not even in New York. This is just a room. Okay, it's a small space. So because of its size, you don't need two ways out of here. Okay. So if you were here, you'd go that way and you'd go this way. What if it's blocked? 
You don't need two ways out of a room. This is just a room. You don't need two ways. So you say, what if it's blocked? If it's just a room, you don't need two ways out of a room. Now, in this case, if, if your stairwell was here, and this didn't exist, OK? This is your stairwell. That, this is your stairwell over here. And um, if this is where, if this is a wall, the, the uh, fire marshal might complain a bit about that, because you're here, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. But technically, that meets the code, right? As long as the distances are good, and the travel distances are good, you can do that, right? So, because um, you don't need two ways out of this space. And once you get to here, you're just like here. You can go right, you can go left, OK? All right, so there's that. And then, um, okay. yes? What if, what if you required to have egress to the stairs at all times of occupancy, regardless of whether there's a power? That's, I don't really understand the question. So you always have access to the, you, have, you always have the ability to get to the stairs, yes. So what he's talking about is the application of special knowledge devices within elevator lobbies that allow you to release a locked door at any time. It is special knowledge. Which he's is talking about a lot of it. Which is, well, but it has to have signage. Or it has, you have to have a telephone to a 24-hour command site. This is all NFPA 101. You know, 11 rights and rules of how to so, fire. So, so. Chris, so you, you're talking about because you get into special knowledge. So, if we go back to my access controlled egress door, the emergency door release, push the button, 30 seconds, that's special knowledge, but it's allowed. So, there's a case where that's special knowledge, but it is allowed right. as long as you do all of them. That's an and between every one of those elements. It's not a do some. Right, because even the, t the telephone to the 24-hour command center. The telephone is different. No, it's still, it, it is considered the same device as that special knowledge device by the code, or at least by the code official. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I would say that the, the audio mechanisms for communication have come in two places in the code. One of them is the ADA as a softer one, where uh, if you're in an elevator vestibule of some sort and you cannot, in your wheelchair, roll to the street safely, you fall down the stairs. No, I'm not talking about that. If you can't roll to the street safely, all right, then if that area is not an area of refuge by definition, then you need a, a communication to a 24-man location where you can call for help to get out with a wheelchair. That's where audio comes in on that one. And then if it's an area of refuge that's in that elevator uh, vestibule, right, uh, which it can be, then the area of refuge communication requirements are more strict, they're, and they're harder in their enlisted systems as opposed to other systems that do the right thing. And so area of refuge audio communication systems uh, specifically in, in one of the last sentences there says if you've got this you don't need to do the other 88 thing that we talked about and so in both cases you need that audio but that's a whole different world than getting out the door in my opinion okay thank you perfect okay um, let me let me go on so how many times do we see this? Here's an a freight elevator, and there's a vestibule here with a door. And people want to lock this door, right? And, and they want to lock it from here in. <laughs> you know, that's like, no, you can't do that. You got to be able to get out of it. And so people try all sorts of things. And depending on how strictly you read the code, if you're locking this side, this side of the door, trying to get out here, then you are in an access control egress door situation. And you just go and do what it says you have to do there, which makes it pretty stupid because it's supposed to have something like a PIR here to unlock it. And it's such a small space, you can't even get out of the elevator without tripping it. So the door is unlocked anyway. So it's not a good plan, right? So that's a design problem. Um, and early design is important. So I would argue that we want something that looks kind of like this. I know I've drawn it a little bit big, but if you're anywhere in here, 
you get access to this stair and that stair if you haven't locked this. This becomes the public space. This becomes the private space. Trying to get the architect to give away the seats that you have to give away on that floor to drive a Z corridor. But that's sometimes hard. But, often hard. But if you want to go to the mantra of always egress to a lower security area, then you need at least a Z corridor. Okay? I don't know what else you do. Because you need two ways out, and if you're here, you can get to there and there. And by the way, one of the lines on that prior uh, slide talked about going through here. You can go through an elevator lobby as the secondary way out. Not as the primary way out, but as a secondary way out. You can go through an elevator lobby to your egress path. Where is it in the code? Say it again. Where is that in the code? Because I didn't know seen that where you couldn't go through the elevator lobby as part of the primary path. Does it come into a joint room? Um, I don't have that number memorized, I'll but give me a card and I'll find it. Okay. I don't, no, I don't have that piece of the code memorized. I do know, anybody know? You, you can't go through an elevator lobby as your primary means of exit. Once you create the Z corridor, there doesn't need to be control on either end of that lobby. So it actually becomes part of the full corridor of egress. The only reason the doors might have been there in a high rise is for smoke control. And so to say that it can only be used as a secondary means, I think is false. It's not, it's not a truism. It's actually got an egress sign at either end of it. It acts as part of the full corridor. You're talking about my former Z corridor? Design? Yes, sir. Well, so my former, former Z corridor design that was here, if you're here, your primary is there and your secondary is there because you're going through it. Because you, you, you need two ways out. So both ways out, oh, I see can't go through it. Okay, okay. That's my qualification. All right, so I've okay. got clients that want to take over this floor. They want to put a lobby here and a reception desk. They want everybody to come in and do the reception desk. And they want to lock this door and this door out to there. And so now, coming out of here, the only way out of here is through there to get to there, right? That doesn't work, right? Because that's that would be everything through. All right, and then we've got architectural elements like parking and exterior spaces. This is the nemesis of us. I always remember there was a company years ago, an electronic company in Silicon Valley called Dyson, uh, and, and they made discs. And they built this really cool building. Uh, it was four stories, including the triangle. And uh, so you, you could, uh, the bottom of the roof, was the height of the seat of that chair at the low end. So you could step up on that roof and you could walk all the way up to the fourth story. It's a cool building, right? And then, and then at the second floor and the third floor and the fourth floor, they cut in patios. So then you had patios up on the second floor, the third floor and the fourth floor. <laughs> and you could stand on the ground, step on the roof, easily walk up this nice little slope and you can step onto any one of those patios but the fire marshal said the roof isn't an egress path so if you're on the patio your egress is into the building okay you can imagine right so so we'll talk about that a little bit but we need to talk about basement parking above ground parking upper floor patios ground floor roofs okay so next slide um so here we are. So here's basement. So I had, a, I had a case. So I had a case where we did a campus, and it had eight buildings. And it had, each one is about six stories. So each one's a quarter million square feet, so the eight of those. And, and podium parking under the whole thing. It's a really neat campus. And I and the security director told the design team, who wasn't listening to either of us very effectively, that we needed the stairwells not to go where they went. So the stairways were like this. And when they were like this, if you get into the garage, you get up here, and now you're in the building, right? And you've got to be able to get out of the building because you've got to go out this way. 
So now you can walk around there. So you were up and in. And the problem with up and in is that you're in the building and we can't secure drive paths nearly as well as we can doors. So we have to consider that the area of this parking is less secure than the building itself in general. At least I, that's my assumption. So I would put a stairway there and basically a stairway here and we, you could get up and out and you could get up and out and then you could do whatever else you wanted in the building and do that. So they basically did a million dollar change order and basically the campus way late in the game, which was interesting at best. Um, but we, we actually did it. Um, and then there's this type of park, which is, which is this type of area here. And that type of area, um, you need to figure out what you're gonna do because when you're up here, and you're trying to get through a stair somehow. You, you want to be able to get down, and there have to be two of them, so you go around the parking somehow. Uh, we want to have stairways in here that can can take you out and take you basically into a into a lobby at least, so you have control of where you're going, um, and get those stairways to interact with the stairways down here and have them independent at this point of what you're doing to exit the building itself as part of the building or this part of the building. And so uh, we've done a bunch of buildings where the parking is down below and it comes up around the building and then there's some public rooms and other things on some of those other floors. And getting the stairways right, everybody goes, ah, that's real estate, that costs me money. Yes, it does, but if you don't do the stairways right, there's no electronic stop that um, Mark can build for me that solves my problem, right? There's nothing. Connects. Good. Thanks. All right, so there's that one. Um, and then, number three, here's a patio. So if you've got a person up here, what's their egress? Their egress is into the building, right? So I've got a situation right now with a 25-foot elevation patio. Uh, in a downtown area where a homeless guy is scaling the wall, getting up on the patio, and his only way off that patio is into the building. So with Spider-Man and all the other things we have, what's the right elevation in general uh, to define this level above the ground before you stop worrying about that, right? So you go up 30 floors, I'm not too worried about somebody. But with all the technologies, you actually climb walls and, and then the architects if they make the wall really really cool it's probably a ladder and so you know you got to be careful what you wish for uh, but so every design needs to consider this relationship and figure out what you're going to do because i guarantee you that when once you get to this point right here you have access into the building okay all right and i had a healthcare one where I was there and they had a gate right here and they originally did it with a panic hardware and it was so easy to get through the mesh of the fencing and use coat hangers and everything else that I got a great picture which I'm not going to show you because I can't find it right now but it had it had a chain on the panic hardware <laughs> I guess we're not supposed to do that right so if you're here you, your your egress is into the building and then out or you can do a gate with, with an egress through the gate. And, and depending on the size, how many, what the loading is, right, you may need two gates. Uh, but you, can, you have to deal with what that gate looks like. So you just keep remembering your egress is into the building. And then what's typical up here on the roof? Uh, we, unless you've got a helica helicopter pad and it's, it's, it's permitted as part of the egress of the building to come off the roof, which is unusual, but in a couple cases, it, it, does exist unless you've got that you pretty much can un you can hard lock the door going out onto the roof but you have to keep the hang glider guys that land on your roof free ability to get into them and get into them okay um you can have them go into a stairwell and lock all the doors on the stairwell so that you're down and out you can do that if you're worried about that type of thing but just that's something you have to deal with up, up on the number four. And then the last piece is that um, 
in San Francisco. A lot of startup companies, and downtown San Francisco is like rife with startup companies with angel funds and stuff like that. And they're taking in all these funky spaces and wanting to make them look really neat. And there's there's cases that we've had where there's a building like right here that's not doesn't belong to, to this this guy. And it's easy to get here and then get on with this roof, and because there's no respect of the code of this. We can put a fence here, okay? That's that's about the only thing we can do. Because there's no need to go between the buildings. So you gotta kind of control that. And we had other cases, I've got one right now where there's there's a parking deck, so I can't control the parking deck. It comes up in its various levels and like this, onto this patio roof that's up here. This patio roof has exiting into the building in two locations. And you can walk right from here. You can just jump about three feet, and you're on this level. And so I've got a real sort of mess there. So there's, those are all those little challenges that we have to keep in mind as you're designing the space. Um, so I'm open to questions. Yeah, your, your roof situation, um, have you tried to move card in card out like you did under IKEA? Yeah. So Dave asked on my roof. Have I tried to get a carding card out? Like, like you do for the... Uh... Yeah, I do that sometimes because I want to know who opened the door, but my card out is a, a shunting of a nuisance alarm, and, and so it's unlocked. I just leave it unlocked. I, I try never to fight the code. I try to just go with the code, go with the flow, and do what I have to do, um, you know, because it's easier. And I, I like to be able to say that you can do, you can go into a building that we've designed and in virtually every case, if you don't uh, have the system up and running, they can still get a CFO because nothing, nothing precludes you. Right? That's what I try to do. Okay, any other questions? John? I, I have a question for the group, and that is, there's been talk about allowing elevators and high rises to be used as egress and fire. And you get 100 if you get a 102-story building, you know, and I'm on the 101st floor in a fire, you want me to walk down? I'll be dead before I, when I got to 475. So has the code, has there, have you heard any more about that? In the, it's in the fire code. It's in the fire code. You can do it now. Uh, okay. There are ways. And in fact, you got to be careful what you do with the elevators. And you got to get it. It's a different, you don't do elevator recall with those. Right. You, you, you return them within their control. And so they do use elevators for, for part of it. Well, that's all. No, that's they recall it. How do you get it? How do I get that? It's all you all don't put recall on those elevators. And all. then you know what your fire floors are. And you know when you're looking at a high rise, they take the fire floor and then they take floors above and below. What are the conversations in? Well, the question was, is, is that for that's hospitals? That's hospital. right. Well, it could be, but no, it it, it, yeah. well, you're going to relocate in a hospital. You're not going to you know, defend the place. But defend the place. Yeah. But then you start taking people out. And somebody's controlling right. the elevators. Right. Yeah. Maybe offer right. your PowerPoint. Say again? Maybe offer the PowerPoint. Yeah, you're going to get all the PowerPoints, but what you won't get is my hand scratch, unfortunately. <laughs> How did that work? Did that work all right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought I wanted to try something different, so there you go. Okay, David. Uh, the situation you talked about there with, where you're trying to regress uh, uh, the garage, basement garage. Yes, okay. Up and out. Right. Not up and in. Uh, we have a That's my mantra. We have a single stab. We have a gate, a chain link gate up above the ground floor. Yeah, you got a stair. We okay, have a stair coming out from the basement. Yes. Okay. It allows egress at grade. Yes. And above grade in the stair, there is a gate to allow you to descend, but not to go up. Oh, it's a little rain. So I, I, I think I got it. So you're 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 using a single stair, and you're putting a gate in the stairway, and we've done that a bunch of times. Yeah. So yeah, and and there's different fire marshals look at it differently. Uh, you got to make sure you have the real estate so that you don't make the right. stair width smaller than the stair width is supposed to be. Be big enough and open far enough. 
And so what we've always done with those, okay, is we put a magnetic hold open on those that's turned off until there's a fire alarm. The magnetic hold open uh, turns on. We push the gate open, it stays open. Nobody's fighting the door closer or anything. So yeah, we've done a bunch of those. That's a, that's a useful way to, to restrict. But lots of people build stairs in an absolute minimum configuration, and then you don't have the real estate to be able to have that that incursion into the stairway space. So that's always part of the original discussion. Uh, we're virtually out of time. Everybody good? All right. Hey.